Hello and welcome back, my friends. Um, hope you enjoyed your um, kind of week off last week. I know I meant to make these videos um, and post them <coughs> for them to all be due um, before we come back um, on Thursday, but I honestly just didn't get around to it. Um, I spent a lot of our flex day catching up on grading for other classes and even for uh, doing prep and, and things like that. So apologies but hopefully you at least enjoyed a bit of a week off. Um, and I also hope that you are enjoying the absolutely gorgeous weather that we are have been having and will continue to have. Um, it's supposed to be like 75 degrees on Wednesday and Thursday, so you know, I'm here for it. Um, it's been a very busy week, at least on my end. I've been working a lot. We're getting to the end of the semester incredibly quickly, right? It is April 24th today, um, and, you know, May is around the corner. <laughs> May will be here next week, literally. And so just some things um, to remind us of um, smart book reading assignments. Please, please, please start chipping away at those. We have now closed the book on Unit 3, so that's Chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. And so realistically, those should be uh, completed. And then um, now we're going to finally get into biology. So we finish up the last part of the semester talking about all the wonderful creatures of, um, of the planet or of the oceans. Um, and today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, we're basically starting from the beginning and where did we evolve from um, how have animals evolved a little bit or more so how have they adapted and um, a lot of really really interesting things I think so I hope that you enjoy this unit as much as you've enjoyed some of the other units it tends to be a student favorite um, for you know reasons of you know it's animals right like who doesn't love talking about animals um, so with all of that uh, with all that said um, also, if you haven't gotten your letters in yet, please get those in. I'm going to start grading those this week as well. So uh, all of those things coming together and the, the end of the semester will be here before we freaking know it. So if you're behind on anything, please be sure to um, start catching up on, on that stuff. All right. So on to, on to the stuff. Um, so this would be lecture 25. So when we talk about biology, we need to kind of back things up way, way, way back. And like, where did we start? Where did life, where do we believe that life began um, in terms of cellular structure? So what we have here is the breakdown between prokaryotes on the left and eukaryotes are here on the right. So the prokaryotes are the most ancient group of organisms. They are unicellular and process single cell structure. Um, but they lack a membrane bound internal structures, including a nucleus. Um, so you can basically, and it, it's more than just bacteria, but you can think of it as um, bacteria. And bacteria is still very, very present in today's world and space, right? Like your body is covered in bacteria, your, inter your internals are covered in bacteria. Um, you have bacteria all over your face, your mouth, the, you know, everything is um, bacteria. It's microscopic. You can't see it with your, with your um, own eyes. And there's differences between good bacteria and bad bacteria, right? Like you don't really want the bad bacteria hanging out in your little body. Um, we like the good stuff, yeah? Um, and then from there, over long time periods, very, very long time periods, um, if you kind of remember back at the very, very beginning of the semester when we talked about um, the timeline of, of, you know, the universe and our, and our planet, how long it took to go from actually having our oceans to having multi-celled creatures. So going from prokaryotes to eukaryotes did take a long time. So the eukaryotes uh, appear much later in the fossil record and all of us contain a complex cell structure, nucleus and mitochondria. Um, I think the one thing that we all remember from um, lower level uh, biology is that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Um, and that really is true, you know, uh, they really, the mitochondria does a, a whole hell of a lot um, for for cell structure and um, just really keeping everything kind of in a homo homeostatic state. Um, so the difference between some of us, we have like kind of three main um, sections in terms of eukaryotes. So we have kingdom animalia. So that's, oh, that's us. We, we reign in that one. Uh, kingdom fungi. 
And fungus are really fascinating as well. Um, I personally freaking love mushrooms. It's probably one of my favorite. Uh, it's not really a vegetable, but it's my one of my favorite things to add into food. Um, and then, of course, kingdom plantae. And then we also have protists. Proto <laughs> protists as well. Um, and that would include things like plankton. So even though plankton are real tiny microscopic, um, they still have a very interesting and complex cellular structure. Um, and I cannot wait to talk about um, plankton when we get there. It's one of my favorite um, parts of this unit. And we can further classify organisms and that's something called taxonomy. Um, so these are some of the ca uh, categories of some marine organisms. So we have um, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, and these are just five um, different organisms uh, ranging from sperm whale, emperor penguin, Chinook salmon, bay scallop, and giant kelp. So we, we can't negate the whole plant situation that's in the ocean. There's tons of plants in the ocean um, and they're, they're really, really fascinating in my opinion anyway. And we have to also recall that the ocean is an incredibly biodiverse space. So biodiversity uh, refers to the richness and the variety of life found on our planet. The oceans have representatives from 28 different phyla compared to only 11 in the terrestrial environment. To me, that just like Right. Like you, I feel like if you think about like how many creatures there are on land, like if you watch like any of those like planet Earths where it's, you go to like the Amazon rainforests and even in the deserts or, you know, just in land all around you. And that's really diverse and really crazy and different types of, of uh, organisms. And then the oceans have 17 more phyla, which is really, really crazy to me. I don't know. I know I get real excited about that, but it's it's trippy. It's a it's a trip, I think. Um, okay, and then uh, this occurs because there's fewer habitats in the ocean, um, with much greater uh, environmental stability than on land. So if we recall back to what we talked about with um, ocean vertical structure, um, and we saw that about 75% of the oceans all have range from zero to four degrees Celsius and have the same salinity of about 34 um, and a half parts per thousand, right? Or 35 um, per, parts per thousand, 35%, or 3.5%, excuse me. So because that stuff is, is relatively constant, there's not really a whole massive need for new species to evolve um, when populations aren't separated, right? Um, in time or reproductive capability. So much of the ocean is rather undisturbed for all intents and purposes, which I think is is really kind of neat. Um, and a diverse space is a happy space, right? We need top predators, we need bottom feeders, we need plants, we need coral, you know, um, a happy coral reef is a coral reef with sharks. Um, so, and other predators keep everything in check, right? Like we really need to make sure that um, those areas are are protected. So it's always good to also remember like who came up with evolution, right? So that was Charles Darwin came up with that uh, theory of evolution because he was in the Galapagos Islands and saw, you know, the differences between the animals between the different islands, which was weird. Um, and so he kind of has coined, um, coined that theory. And then I want to talk a bit about um, biodiversity hotspots. So we really a, a biodiverse space is a happy space, kind of just what I was just saying, but um, it's a really, really important tool for measuring the health of an ecosystem and conservation programs. So say, for example, like with coral reefs, if there's a lack of sharks in the coral reef, then another animal can kind of dominate and then can maybe decimate a coral reef, or it's just, we have these top predators to keep everything in check um, and to make sure that conservation efforts are working. And then, um, of course, things like uh, ocean acidification and sea, surf sea surface temperature rise impact biodiversity in a very bad way, right? So if a creature um, is negatively impacted by ocean acidification, then you're not going to have that creature there anymore, which can then um, have implications kind of further down the line. Same thing with uh, sea temperature rise, right? And that, that one with coral bleaching is huge, right? So 
coral is very, very sensitive to temperature changes. And um, when you decimate a coral reef, you basically take away the entire, um, like, mass, right? I know I reference Finding Nemo a lot, but, like, the beginning scenes where they're, you know, with Mr. Ray and going around the uh, coral reef and, like, they're naming off all the creatures and the names and stuff, that wouldn't exist if the coral wasn't there. Like, the coral is literally the base of that ecosystem. Very similar to how, you know, kelp are here, um, and we have our lovely sea otters to help keep the urchin in check, that kind of thing. Um, okay, actually, I'm going to go ahead and give that a pause, um, or actually, yeah, yeah, we'll go ahead and give that a pause. So, um, in the next videos, we'll continue to talk about um, the flow of energy and the different kind of categories of creatures and then um, finish up with the adaptations and things of that nature. Thank you for watching.